Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I would like to thank Jean-Jacques Hublin for inviting me to, talk part, um, to take part sorry, in this symposium. Um, my talk will be divided into three parts. First of all, um, on the timing of eating meat during the Paleolithic, then on the main proxies to assess the subsistence strategies and energetics of the past hominins, and at last, we will test the application of some ecological models to archaeology. First of all, let's have a quick overview on the evolution of the proportion of meat in the human diet. Despite an omnivorous diet among non-human and human primates, we can see an increase of carnivorous food during the Paleolithic, in parallel with that of hunting capacities. The first two evidences of meat consumption are dated prior to 3 million years in Eastern Africa, initially with the earliest butchery marks found in the site of Dikika in Ethiopia. A couple of years later, in West Turkana, lithic artifacts were discovered at around 3.3 million years. The second main step is about 2 million years, still in Africa, where we have an increased number of sites with cut marked animal remains and stone tools. Here, the example of the old one site of Kandra, oh, sorry, in South Kenya, where more than 50 bone fragments of small and medium sized bovids have been processed by humans. They highlight meat consumption and also early evidence of small bovids hunting like gazelles. Other sites saw the scavenging of big animals, as here in the Achillean base camp of the Bait 2 of Old Duvai, where some cut marks are present on an extinct giraffidae. The increase of meat goes along with other important changes, like the emergence of a new type of hominins at 1.9 with big brain, the sudden reduction in molar size, many due to a shorter tearing time thanks to cooking or non-thermal food processing methods, and then the onset of a chilean with early occurrence of fire use and ungulate predation. For Neanderthals, large amount of herbivore remains in archaeological sites, stable isotope pressures, residue deposition on human teeth in the dental calculus as on lithic tools, and tooth micro-rare studies all highlight the great proportion of animal proteins among the diet, with an estimation of 80% coming from animals and 20% from plants. Despite this high carnivorous diet, many Neanderthal groups consumed plants. Now, what about ma the main consequences of eating meat on human evolution in terms of biology, societies, and energy? We know that some apes may sometimes hunt small prey and count a part of meat in their diet. However, for humans, it is more important, as expressed here by a famous primatologist, Sherwood Washburn. So what does it mean to eat meat, at least during the early Paleolithic period? Anatomical adaptations, increase of social cooperation, the food sharing, the development of cutting stone tools, the enlargement of the hunting territories and possibly first dispersals, the direct competition with other great carnivores, and the point that we will develop now, the time and energy benefit in the food supply brought by a greater quantity of protein and fat. To deal with the subsistence practices and the energetics of hominins, we need a multi proxies approach, taking into account the hominin capacities, biological, social, and cultural features, the paleoenvironmental <laughs> constraints, like pre-availability, seasons, topography, and other competitors, the archaeological and geochemical data, and then the actualistic data and ecological models, such as what we call human behavioral ecology, a neo-Darwinian approach that behavioral changes, changes sorry, may result from natural selection rather than cultural motivations. Since the 70s, many ethnographic studies of hunter-gatherer societies have provided data on human biology and diet. We know, for example, that we have a daily energy expenditure of 2,000-3,000 kilocalories per day, which is more related to body size, age, and sex than to lifestyle differences, as Herman Ponzer pointed out yesterday. <clears throat> we also know that the foraging diet of hunter-gatherers includes a mean of 35% of meat for all latitudes combined. Additionally, variation of the diet is related to temperatures and primary production. 
to explain dietary patterns among hunter-gatherer societies. A theory developed by ecologists is called the optimal foraging theory and is applied both to anthropology and archaeology. The optimal foraging theory, foraging corresponding to non-productive food, provides predictions and valuable models to understand better the relation between environment and foragers in the past. What should be eaten, where food should be sought, and how large a group is needed to exploit the food. According to the optimal foraging theory, resources may be chosen first in relation to the energy efficiency in terms of calories. For one model, the diet breadth or pre-choice model, the high-ranked resources are pursued whenever encountered, and the lower-ranked resources are included in the diet as a function of their encounter rates. Given that energy appears as one of the main parameters influencing subsistence strategies, thus it is important to calculate the energy cost and benefit of pre-acquisition. The first variable is the energy cost, expressed in person hours, or handling time, corresponding to the time to pursue and dispatch the prey, carcass processing and transport, and consume, the cheering and digest digesting time. But to take into account the overall costs of acquisition, we have to add also the time spent searching the prey. And the second variable is the energy benefit expressed in kilocalorie. Then the profitability or the post and counter return rate is the ratio between the energetic benefit of the animal and the, type, the time of searching and handling. Past hunter-gatherer societies have developed strategies in pre-acquisition and carcass transport partly in terms of energy cost and benefit, depending on several parameters. The energy of pre-acquisition depends on hunting and scavenging techniques, the type of prey, the size, aggressiveness, the time spent to search, pursue, and dispatch the prey, the presence of other competitors, and the number of hunters. Similarly, carcass transport strategies also depend on the number of hunters, the weight of the, anim of the animal. For Hadza, in Tanzania, for example, 80% of the skeleton are abandoned for adult animals or of large or very large size, compared to only 30% for medium-sized animals. It depends on also the distance from kill site to the camp, to the nutritive value of each carcass species, the age of the animal, for example, the marrow of adults is richer than the marrow of juveniles. And the season, the marrow is the last resource in fat during the winter, explaining, explain, explaining sorry, the interest for bones as metapodials, which are poor in meat but rich in yellow marrow. Now, if we focus on the energy of the animal itself, what can we eat on animal carcasses? Meat, grease, yellow and red marrow, brain, tongue, viscera, etc. Meat and marrow nutrients provide proteins, fat, vitamins, and minerals. Meat and marrow rates and calories depend on the animal and season. For example, a lean meat of beef provides between 100 and 200 kilocalories. But just after me, John Space will talk about the cost of eating too much lean meat in terms of digestion. Fat is higher calorific gain than protein and carbohydrates, twice more. About meat processing. As seen yesterday, thanks to the talk of Amanda Henry, fire improves digestibility and texture, and thus provides energy, and also reduces toxins. There is no loss of proteins during cooking, but for vitamins and mineral elements, the loss is related to temperatures and time of cooking. Vitamins B6, C, and iron decrease if boiled. Those data point out the likely relevance of raw meat in the past human diet. About raw meat, we know different kinds of non-thermal food processing methods, like pounding and grinding meat into a powder, the bone grease rendering and pemmican manufacture, for example, increasing the post-encounter rate, despite implying long-time processing costs. We can also lacerate, ferment, or putrefy meat to favor pre-digestion of the high protein and fat content of raw meat, and also the preservation of vitamins B12 and C. And we may also add some medicinal or, and or flavoring plants in the food preparation. We take now the example of three animals exploited by, by hunter-gatherers to notice their specificities in terms of energy and difficulty to catch. About the reindeer first. The Nunamiut in Alaska are large bands of 100 individuals. 
They are 80% dependent of reindeer hunts and may kill more than 200 reindeers per year using mass kill. The Evenki in Russia are small family groups of five to 10 individuals, and Yoshiko Ab has shown the kill of four reindeers, which are woodland species, for 21 reindeer hunts per year, which represent a very low success rate at about 20%, compared to those of Nunamut, which is around twice more. The tracking of reindeer by foot can last more than 11 hours, including the kill site butchery. In that case, the post-encounter return rate for reindeer is about 7,000, but it is much lower when the success rate has been taken into account. If we look at an elephant now, an elephant provides a huge amount of meat, about two tons, compared to the 40, 60 kilo of meat for a reindeer. Despite that rate, this big animal is not often hunted among past and present hunter-gatherers. According to a recent study from ethnographic and historic data, first of all, we have to take into account the hunting failure. The bigger the prey is, the more likely we miss it. Larger sized prey are less abundant in the landscape, and hunters spend more time to catch them. And the success rate for elephants is only of 20% for bison hunters in Zambia. Secondly, the time to pursue it can be up to 38 hours for an elephant. The authors highlight the strong, on this graph, the strong and positive correlation between the size of the prey and the time of pursuit. And lastly, large games represent extensive processing and transport effort with many individuals, with, for example, 86 hours of butchering time for an elephant. But now, why elephants are sometimes hunted? Other considerations that ener than energetic return rate can lead to hunt big game, like, for example, the maintaining social position. Finally, for lagomorphs, the encounter rate is much higher for, than for reindeers and elephants, 80% of success, but they are also less productive. Indeed, the rabbit is small, providing only around 2.5 kilo of meat, and in addition is very poor, poor in lipids, which may result in protein toxicity called rabbit starvation. But taken into account the encounter rates, we have seen that, that the profitability of reindeers and elephants are quite similar. We will now apply some of those actualistic and ecological data to archaeology, taking one case with reindeers. The Abri du Maras is a late Middle Paleolithic site of southeastern France. Like many other archaeological records with reindeer dominated assemblages at the end of the Middle Paleolithic in Western Europe, we have a large amount of reindeers present in this layer, with 16 individuals having a catastrophic age profile and autonal kills likely highlighting mass reindeer predation during migration events. We have evidence of all the edible resources exploited at this camp, marrow, meat, bone grease, and we have many evidences also of fire use. On this graph, in blue, we have the carcass portions present on the site, and in red, the food utility index expressed in quantity of meat, grease, and marrow. The scarcity of all the spongious part of the skeletal, heads, vertebra, ribs, as well as pelvis and scapula, and the short articular bones, highlights their abundance on the skill side during the early butchery stages and or their specific processing at the camp for grease bone extraction or for their use as fuel, which may induce misinterpretations sometimes of the skeletal profiles. To illustrate now the energy intake from this faunal spectrum on this site, I try to have a look on the species rank related to their rate of, of meat. With the calculation of the amount of energy obtained, we get 3.5 tons of available meat if we count the complete slaughtered animals, representing 4 million of kilocalories, which can feed about 20 hunter-gatherers during two months and a half. In terms of optimal foraging theory, we can point out some assumptions in this site, like the selective diet highlights maybe a rich environment with a low encounter time, the reindeer likely had the highest encounter rate among animals, with great autonal migrations. They were also safer and more easily transportable than bison, while 16 reindeers are equal to two bison. And lagomorphs were probably the result here of opportunistic encounters. About carcass transport strategy, the selection of some carcass portions appears to have been made according to the weight of the animals. 
The choice of some pieces was related to the food utility index for some, but also to non-food products like animal pelts. Thank you. To conclude now, <laughs> um, human behavioral ecology models um, are useful to predict which resource is edible and suitable or not into the diet. And then, if not, it may be a question of tradition. For example, totems and taboos, like many stripped animals in Africa. And then, if, um, sorry, and those models may be also a help for understanding diet practices, changes, and non foraging activities such as childcare or reproduction. We must be aware that in applying human behavioral ecology, it is necessary to contextualize the data according to palimpsest biases, using geoarchaeology, refittings, seasonal data, spatial analysis, etc. Et and also um, taking into account cultural changes and specificities. And we have also to keep in mind, at last, that other goals and not only caloric return may prevail in the diet choices, such as acquisition of fat, vitamins, minerals, or non-food products like pelts, bone tools, or ornaments. Thank you very much for your attention.